thanks a lot for your uh, introduction. My speak today will be on um, how to enhance the throughput of 3D printers for food application and uh, bottlenecks and possible solutions that can be used for this uh, kind of issue. Uh, so this presentation today is done on behalf of many of my colleagues uh, from uh, Uniris and from INRA as well, and also from Bianca uh, Maniglia that will be presenting, who will be presenting a bit later today. We, this work is co-funded by different funds, especially EU and regional funds. And next day we have, I'm chairing, um, um, supervising a, a, an international chair where we have two ongoing PhD uh, working on these uh, 3D printing applications. And previously we had quite some activity in this area and so it's growing in terms of activity. I'm also a member of a cluster of excellence that is called math for am so it's math for Add Additive Manufacturing. And this is dealing with different academic partners in the regional area with industry and health of the future using 3D printing. Uh, in terms of state of the art, what, uh, what you can see on uh, all the papers that are existing is that the, the mass throughput of uh, most of the 3D printers is around one or a few ml per minute. Uh, first of all, I would, like to, I would like to remind that the, the first inventor of the 3D printing and the, copy machine was Professor Tournesol with uh, Tintin uh, et le lac Coroquin. And in this um, cartoon, um, Professor Tournesol invented a machine that was able to copy, to duplicate the uh, hat of the Dupont uh, and Dupont uh, people. And uh, this was, I think, the first pioneer work about uh, 3D printing and copying machine. Um, now coming back to, to what is going on today, what uh, is uh, used most of the time is either gel deposition without eating, which is smart, but uh, you have to go through uh, following up uh, baking. You can make also hot melt extrusion, that is gel deposition after eating or lactone before uh, using chocolate that has to cool down to obtain a solid object. Uh, and you can also play with co-extrusion like was uh, presenting uh, Mario with uh, Jekyll <coughs> using uh, calcium chloride, for example, and reacting gels. The issue is it's difficult to manage to obtain foamy systems. Um, the small the flow rate is not so high, and uh, a follow-up cooking is usually needed. So, in terms of bottlenecks, uh, what we are dealing with is indeed the bottleneck focusing on the die of the 3D printers that has some limitations. If you think about most of the printing systems that are existing, you have a plunger or uh, anything that is pushing a uh, uh, printing ink, ink sorry, through a heating system, uh, that is a printing die. And in case you have to heat up the preparation, the ink, you, you need a heater that will be a heated surface on the wall. Um, so we, we assume here that the heating stage occur in the die. And the question is how to increase the mass or volumic flow rate of the system. We must first ensure that the full heat up of the Printing ink, ink is obtained at the end of the die, and also to ensure the correct deposition. Um, if you look at how to enhance the uh, mass flow rate, you have to consider the heat diffusion time in the die. And this uh, heat diffusion time that is related to the time needed to heat up the ink in the die is linked to the square of the diameter of the die. In other words, if you want to, for example, multiply the diameter by two, the heating time will be multiplied by four, roughly, and the velocity uh, has to be divided by four to ensure a proper resistance time in the printing die and then to ensure heating. In other words, um, globally, if, since the velocity is divided by, by four, but the cross-section of the die is multiplied by four, whatever you do in terms of increasing or modifying the diameter of the printing die will yield a constant volumic flow rate and there will not be any progress in terms of uh, throughput. The other issue is that if you okay, increase the diameter, you will decrease the velocity and you can think about increasing the length of the die to increase the residence time and then to enhance the volumic flow rate. But then you will be facing issue with the shear stress. At first, if you have uh, too much shear stress on the wall of the printing die, you may expect uh, wrinkling and low quality in terms of uh, deposition of the ink. This can be an issue in terms of quality of the object. And the other issue is that you, if you increase 
the lens of the printing die, you will may have die swell uh, problems. That is due to overpressure in the die, resulting in an expansion of the printing ink at the exit of the um, of the die. So this will be also some issue in terms of controlling the quality of the printing object. Some solution that can be used is, for example, to have mixing the printing die. So, for example, Mario Jekyll has been using in some of his work a viscotech system that is uh, coming from the um, cosmetic or pharmaceutical industry. So it's a kind of a single screw extruder that can be used to mix up the preparation in the uh, printing die. And this can enhance the heat transfer, even though it exposes the ink to uh, some uh, shearing and some uh, possible degradation. You can also add up volumic heating. That can be another way of ensuring a proper heating. And in that case, you may think about microwave, but inflow microwave is, I would say, a complicated topic, especially in the case of uh, 3D printing. We're facing small dimensions in the die, and this will not be uh, poorly adapted to the uh, wavelength of the uh, microwave and will be quite complicated to use uh, in terms of um, 3D printing. The other alternative on which we work on in the group is here is the inflow ohmic heating. So in that case, it's a volumic heating. You flow a current uh, through uh, ink or any fluid that is containing water and some solutes, it's ideally a little bit of salt. And um, this gives access to high throughput and high mass flow rate. Since the volumic heating is there, um, you can think about very large volume in the printing die. The only or uh, one of the major challenges you will be facing is to keep contact between the ink and the electrodes and to have also um, a, a, an adapted um, electrical conductivity of the ink to ensure a uh, joule effect that is uh, matching with the what you expect in terms of uh, heating up. Uh, in fact, ohmic baking and using uh, ohmic heating has been uh, adopted and explored by different researchers, especially uh, this pioneer work from Baker, uh, who was developing already some uh, crustless bread in 1939 uh, using homogeneous heating. And since a couple of years, um, ohmic heating has been addressing a lot of interest for research and it's also used in some industry for doing crumb, for example. Uh, okay, so let's go to possible solution. What are we doing now in Oniris and Inra as a improvement of this uh, possible high throughput printers for food application. We have developed a um, prototype experimental system that is uh, using, you can see here, um, a piston here that is pushing the pound cake batter. So we're working with pound cake batter at the moment. And the printing die is here and is equipped with a specific um, electrode to ensure uh, correct uh, heating of the, uh, of the batter. And then some controlling system with the data logger with some thermocouple allow to control the, the mass flow rates of this system. And this is able to produce some pre-baked uh, batter. We already completed one PhD with um, Monique Codir uh, two years ago. And the electrodes and the concept has been also patented to cover the um, design of the electrodes in particular and the geometry of the channel of the printing die. You can see here some temperature rise. Uh, this was presented in the last ISF Congress in Melbourne. I think it was with a poster and short presentation. Uh, in that case, you can see the heat up uh, of the batter in the channel. And um, this is in fact the uh, setting up of the, um, of the uh, how to say, um, of the heat transfer in the system. And, and after let's say 300, Second, so five minutes, you reach a steady state, and then you can uh, flow the batter um, with a mass flow rate in the range of 100 ml per minute. Um, it could be a little bit more because in that case, the channel was, I think, in the range of five centimeter long. So if you think about extending a little bit the channel, you may even go to higher mass flow rate. So compared to what is existing actually in the literature with um, with um, 3D printing, you're dealing with um, um, a magnification of the mass flow rate by, let's say, 10 to 100 factors that can be even more. The other thing we have been playing with, and this will be presented in detail by Bianca a bit later on, 
uh, in these confronts is to modify the starch for having a faster gelatinization and then enhancing uh, the printing rate. Uh, so for that, we've been developing, uh, and it was the work of Bianca as a postdoc in our group, some functional starches using different technology, ozone dry heat treatment and pulse electric field in particular, to develop some uh, starch that has a better gelatinization capability and that can uh, undergo um, uh, or uh, um, ex exhibit a much um, better printing quality compared to control. So you can see here some <coughs> uh, starch that has been treated and then you can see the quality of the printed object. We had a, a few papers on this topic thanks to the hard work of Bianca. Um, so what is next for the outlook? <coughs> this could be maybe the uh, actual situation of the baking industry and maybe in a few years we'll be developing some uh, inflow mic baking with, with uh, much more capability and high throughput. The first challenge we are facing now is to deal with, with aeration, that is expansion during baking, <clears throat> because actually we've been working with uh, baking uh, with um, pound cake batter that was not uh, containing any uh, expansion media like baking powders. And right now we have two ongoing PhD uh, shared between Oniris and Inra to develop application with pound cake uh, using baking powders. So in that case, we need to adjust the recipe adjust the batter relogy and adjust a lot of things to uh, ensure that the batter to cramp condition will occur uh, in a good manner uh, using the omic baking. We have to adapt also the mix of baking powder to ensure a good expansion at a good rate uh, in the inflow baking system. And um, we also have to adapt, of course, to channel geometry since we are dealing with expansion inflow, it's uh, inflow baking. Then we have to deal with this um, uh, adjustment of the <coughs> channel to ensure that the electrodes will always be in contact with the uh, expanding uh, baking uh, system. And then uh, thinking about um, high throughput systems, uh, we can end up with some kind of co-extrusion uh, systems and concept. So in that case, if you think about uh, conveying baking oven, the batter that will be produced by the omic baking system will be like a, a pre-baked uh, batter. And then we can think about uh, some co-extrusion and playing with the uh, printing dye that will deliver a different taste or different type of butter to obtain a kind of a 2D uh, cut view of a cake. And um, then the dead axis will be coming with the traveling of the butter pre batter in a conveying oven. Uh, and in that case, you can think about the, uh, playing with writing like is shown on this uh, old, I would say paper almost 10 years back, um, showing the interest of uh, making personalized cakes or um, any uh, similar uh, kind of cake We're using chocolate and vanilla uh, system, for example. So I'm finished with my presentation. I'd just like to mention I will be chairing the uh, ICF 14 conference. It's one of the major uh, food conference uh, at the world scale that will be held in Nantes in 2023, and you are invited to come. For sure, there will be a lot of 3D printing uh, topic and uh, lectures during this conference. And with that, I'm, I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you. <laughs>